So I think that kind of to sum up kind of what we talked about today, what is Christianity? What would you say is what it takes to be saved? So maybe first, what what's the essentials to be saved? And then what does being saved look like? So what does it take to be saved? Interesting question. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Basically, Paul and Silas are doing their missionary journeys. They're imprisoned for preaching about Jesus. But God brings an earthquake in order to save them, or to get them out of prison. Um, when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Here's the thing. They were in um, basically the jurisdiction of Rome. Rome was completely vicious in the way that they handled prisoners and executions. If you failed to execute someone who you were assigned to execute, you would be killed. If you had a prisoner under guard and they escaped, you would be killed. This prisoner assumed that as soon as the prisoners, which is Paul and Silas, or sorry, this jailer assumed that as soon as the prisoners had the ability to leave, which they did because the doors were open and their bonds weren't fastened, they would leave. And so obviously he thought, I'm going to get killed because these people who I was supposed to watch have escaped. That's why he was about to kill himself, because he would rather kill himself than be killed. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you in your household. But here's the thing. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. He was unable to believe in that moment because he didn't have the word of the Lord yet. So, you need to believe what the word of the Lord is. And what is that? It's the gospel. It's that Jesus died for us. It's, it's, and it's a deep recognition that we need a Savior. Here's one interesting thing. This is Paul talking to him in Acts chapter 16. And he, the only thing he says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. But then in Acts 17, when he's preaching to um, pagans within the Areopagus, this is what he says. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. There's, a, there's this question that's lingered for a lot of people. Some people say you need to repent and believe. Some say you just need to believe. And it's instance, instances like this which make people confused. Do I repent and believe or just believe? Here's what I would say. Belief entails repentance when we say believe and repent we're just making it more um illicit we're just making it more obvious here's the main thing this is how you become saved when you hear the word of the lord and believe it which is that jesus died for our sins that we have failed to live up to the standard that god has placed as his image bearers on us that we have utterly failed to be righteous and to be holy, um, that we deserve punishment, but that God, being rich in mercy, decided to take our punishment on himself so that there could be reconciliation with God. Salvation, a lot of people are confused. They think that the only thing salvation is, is going to heaven. But first and foremost, it's reconciliation with God. If God isn't in heaven, heaven isn't heaven. A lot of people want to go to heaven. They don't want Jesus there. If you don't want Jesus in heaven, you're not saved. Jesus is who we love. We as the church are, are going to be married to Jesus in a, in a beautiful marriage um, feast. So if you want to be saved, um, you could, you know, declare, declare um, with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead, that God raised Jesus from the dead, that he died for our sins. Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like that's really great explanation. You said just that we say belief and repentance together just to make it more obvious, but that we're saved through faith, you know, by grace. So yes, we're saved by believing in, but then it's also like what you said, 
it's like what James said that, you know, it's not just believing that something's true that saves us, you know, obviously the demons believe that Jesus is God and that, you know, he died for the sins of the world, but they don't submit to God. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a belief that it's true, but I think it's also surrendering to him. Like you said, it's repentance. That's kind of what it entails because faith, it, a great sign in him is trust. Now to trust something, you obviously need to think it's true. It also means that you're trusting that person. You've entered into a relationship with that person. And that's what, that's what faith means. It comes from the word pistis, which means trust. So when we trust in Jesus, obviously we believe he's God. He died for us and that we're trusting him with our salvation. I feel like that's another great clarification that you've talked about. As Christians, we have hope. Now, that's not what our worldly definition of hope is. You know, I say, oh, I hope that it rains tomorrow and I don't have to work. That's just a hope of something that could happen. You know, I don't know if it will or if it won't. I just hope it does. That's not the Christian hope. Scripture talks about hope in the sense of assurance. In other words, we can be sure. And that's exactly what this trust in Jesus is about. We have hope in him. We have assurance in him. That when we die, because he's covered our sins, we've entered a relationship with him, that's going to continue forever. We're going to be with him forever. And like you said, that being with him, that's paradise. You know, heaven without God, if you take Jesus, if you take God out of heaven, that's hell by definition. People who want heaven without God, they don't want heaven, they want hell. And that's that's just the reality of it. So yes, it's trusting in God and being in relationship with him, which that's done by faith, by accepting what he's done, by trusting him, entering a relationship. And that's ultimately what it's about. We have trust in him about the future. We have hope and assurance about the future because we've entered into a relationship with him now and he's not going to let go. We'll, we'll be with him forever. And that is heaven. That's paradise. And that is what we mean by salvation. Yeah. And um, I'm two examples, just, just demonstrating the difference between belief and faith. Um, you know, they have those trust falls. Let's say this is a person. Um, if I believe that the chair is there, but I don't have faith, I won't lean back and trust them to catch me. And then the other example is that Abdul Murray and Nabil Qureshi. Um, I love those guys. <laughs> but um, especially Nabil, he, he got to the point where intellectually he couldn't but believe that Christianity was true, that Jesus did rise from the dead. But he told David Wood, I cannot have faith because of what it will cost me. And so here's, here's, here's Nabil, who knows it is true, who believes that it's true, but he doesn't have faith yet because he hasn't surrendered, because he, because he looked at the cost of, of saying yes to Jesus, and he hadn't said yes yet. He did eventually say yes. He did become a Christian, but it's just showing the difference. Now, for what we do, um, you know, after we're Christians, this is just a real statement, but this is what it says. While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. That's everyone. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one will even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have now received reconciliation. While we were God's enemies, Jesus died so that we could have reconciliation. This is Romans chapter 5. Now, when you go to Romans 6, so at the end of Romans 5, it talks about how um, where, sin, where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. Saying that, yeah, we had a lot of sins. Yeah, they may look like so much, but that God's grace is more than enough. That it's so much more than that. But then this is what Paul says. And this is what I want to talk about. What then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. We too might walk in the name of Here's the thing. 
we understand all our sins are forgiven. We've been set free. We're no longer under bondage to sin. But that doesn't mean that we want to sin because we have died to our old selves. We have died with Christ and have been raised with him into newness of life. So we want to live for Christ, to live as Christ to die as King. Now, we can't always fulfill this. We can't always live as Christ lived because we're still in our flesh. We've been made new, but our flesh will still cling to us in this life. And here's what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, the next chapter. I find it to be a law that, I, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Paul's saying, I want to follow God. I want to be obedient. But I find another law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. That sin will still cling to me even when I want to do right. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And here comes the rejoicing. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. We've been set free. Does that mean we continue to sin? By no means. Because don't you know that you who have died, have died with Christ, have been baptized into his death, have been raised with Christ. So we walk after Christ. We walk and we run this race to follow after Christ now that we are Christians. We become saved through his sacrifice, through grace, through faith. And as Christians, we follow his example. And that's why we have to know who Jesus is. That's why we have to know who God is. That's all we have to Yeah, that's awesome. And I feel like that's a really cool thing to think about. We're not just saved from something. We're given a new life. We're saved for something. We're given a mm-hmm. new life. We're made into a new creation. And that's exciting. You know, we're not just living this life waiting till it ends to join Jesus in heaven. But we still have a purpose here. We have a new purpose here. And so we're not just wandering aimlessly over the hills of life. No, there's a purpose. There's a plan that God has for us here. So now that we've concluded that Christianity is true, and we have a little bit of a grasp on what Christianity is, what the core fundamentals are, and this should drive us to learn more, of course, but now that we know it's true and this is what Christianity is, now our next thing should be, okay, so how do we start doing what Jesus has called us to do, you know, sharing the gospel? And that's what we're going to talk about next week, which is kind of going to be our closing for this amount of time. For Generation Zion, we're going to talk about, okay, so how do we actually start getting out there? How do we start sharing the gospel? How do we start using apologetics? So that's what we'll do next week, and I'm excited for that.